you know, Rev 12 being all about this birth, a woman even in travail, basically anguish, giving birth to this man child. You have to put this into perspective of the entirety of the whole. Basically, our world history is going to provide the evidence for the understanding of where this birthing symbology gets its origin from. It's connected, as we've already stated here, to Genesis 6, these sons of God taken unto themselves the daughters of men. In this archaeological artifact, once again, another type of Venus figurine, another type of the sacred feminine, another type of Ishtar, another image of the daughters of men being seen as these birth vehicles, these sacred cows. Um, what's going to be unique about this that's going to help us clarify <laughs> amazingly what all of this seems in some ways so difficult to understand is where this artifact is found, even the nature of the pose of the artifact here, and then this curious bit of eyeliner that you see around the artifact. But the location is going to be the main key because this is found around the area of Mount Hermon in um, what is known as Jordan. So you know that Jordan literally means or is derived from the word Yardan, which literally means the place of descent. And it's talking about the place of descent from which these sons of God um, named as such Sam Yeza Azazel and so forth in the book of Enoch, these fallen ones, um, this was the region that they descended into from Mount Hermon when they took their oath. And this was the area that they took the very daughters of men. And as I said, it was a plan. It really wasn't necessarily their plan, but it was the plan of a fallen prince of this world, who you know of as the devil or the serpent or Leviathan or Apollyon. Nonetheless, the serpent's plan was to, of course, produce the fall of these sons of God who were sent here to do this very high work of basically fostering civilization along a spiritual path, of which they began to do, of which some of the earliest legends of Atlantis can testify to. But then, of course, we have the fall. And then from the fall point forward, we know that our civilization has pursued a rocky course. And uh, pun intended with anybody that understands that Ephraim is considered the stone of Israel, even connected further to Rev 13, that millstone sent from Ephraim upon his own nation by his own counsel for the woods of Hosea. It's all there. So, wow. Uh... So kind of hear me out here. What I'm trying to convey is that if these sons of God were basically tempted even by the prince, this morning star himself known as the devil, the planetary prince, who was at the beginning perfect in his trust. And then, of course, this iniquity was found in him. And we know that because these beings connected to the fall associated with the assemblage of the dragon lucifer and satan were cast out of heaven now as lucifer and satan are cast out of heaven you have to realize that this connects us to satan being the false prophet in his connection to going to and fro amongst the stones of fire which would be the individual solar systems or the individual planetary sun systems. So because we have a planetary prince, of which this Inky is, and who was originally entrusted to the spiritual watch care of this planet until Jesus Christ completed his bestowal mission upon it. Now you should already know that the Bible readily produces um, many scriptures attesting to Jesus Christ um, inheriting his throne upon this world. And we know that he does it by experience, by his own choosing to live as one of his creations, 
to live as a man of the realm of his own creating and overcome the temptations of the flesh. And in this instance, he overcame the temptation of the deceiver who sought to tempt him while he was in the flesh. So this final seventh bestowal, which just so happened to be taking place upon our world, is when Jesus Christ has now, in essence, truly received the full title of the complete ruler of this universe by his own choosing to fulfill himself as such as one of his creations and then overcome the very same difficulties that he asks us to overcome, he himself asked of himself. And then that's why we see he goes before us even upon the cross and has already bared the humiliation and the suffering and the slander and the scorn, even the physical abuse and he's already gone through it triumphantly. So we too know that we can also do the same in Jesus' name. So understand that because they've already been cast out of the heavenly abode and this connection with Satan now going to and fro amongst the stones of fire, earth just so happens to be one of those of which our planetary prince, as is quoted in chapter 28 of the book of Ezekiel, that clarifies this being perfect in all its ways at the time of the Garden of Eden. Now, the, the quotation is really about the planetary prince itself. But, of course, they confuse these titles between Lucifer, Satan, and the devil and try to make you believe that it's all a titleage of the same individual. It would be if you took it into perspective of the assemblage of the dragon, more importantly, the three-headed dragon, more importantly, Tiamat, which is in reference of the trident of which the serpent or the devil itself is supposed to carry, which represents this trident, this three-headed deity of the assemblage of the dragon, Lucifer, Satan, and the devil, which is also known as the beast, the serpent, and the false prophet. So nonetheless, we're dealing with three separate personalities. As Lucifer and Satan are cast out, we see that recanted in Revelation chapter 12, and then, of course, the false prophet Satan is the one who is entrusted to corrupt our personal planetary prince. So the planetary prince has an original beginning of original spiritual intent from the father himself on this planet until he rebels. And then we see in Ezekiel 28 that that is recorded, his rebellion. So it's associated now with his plan to maintain a dominion. And because he is unable by the book of Enoch, the record of Enoch, and even the record of the Hebrew Bible, he's unable to enter back into the heavenly abode. They are barred. So the only other logical solution for this serpent prince, who is a prince of this material world known as earth, is to conceive himself in a material form. And that's exactly what he has planned to do from the moment he has understood this wicked plan of high places that is completely all encompassed in what we know concerning the story of the serpent lie in the Garden of Eden as he tempts mankind with this idea that he can bring them to deity. And this is the temptation where we see it really only originates within the daughters of men that were chosen. And then this is where we get these sacred rites of succession, which follow the feminine lineage to give the royal scepter to, that, which means this rites of succession is going to follow the genetic tree, the tree, the family tree, on the woman's side because she gives two-thirds more genetic material to the offspring than the male. This is why the women were seen as sacred by these high spirit beings to create the vehicle to secure their dominion in this realm. So getting to the point where we come to this artifact here. In order for this fallen prince, Inky, of spirit form to enter into a material body, he has to enter him into a material body where the seal has already been broken. He just can't 
possess any old man. is because mankind has been given free will. This free will is encoded in the very atomic structure of the atom itself that is further relayed into the understanding of the geometry of what you would see as the star of David that I would call the star tetrahedron that is associated with circumscribed tetrahedral geometry, which is also known as the sixth seal. So this sixth seal this atomic geometry, this seal upon the dominion of the creation of Earth, which is in the particulates of all things from micro to macro, even the Earth itself is basically enveloped in this terrestrial field management known as circumscribed tetrahedral geometry. So if you want to understand about that, view a series that I did entitled Geometry, the Binding of Terrestrial Spirits. So, in order for this fallen prince to enter into a body, he has to produce a lineage of willing descendancy that willfully accept his doctrines, willfully have already given up their soul to his cause. And then this is where the portion of the Nephilim descendancy comes in. But you should also always remember what is clarified in, I think that it's the book of Ezekiel, where it clarifies that the children cannot be judged by the sins of the father. And this also is going to go for the Nephilim themselves, because the Nephilim descendancy are known also as the mighty men. And if you know your Bible correctly, you'll see that even the armies of David consisted of these great mighty men. And then at the very same time, they were fighting and trying to destroy these other mighty men. So there was mighty men on both sides of the coin, both the good and bad, those that had fallen and those that were unfallen. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes in. But nonetheless... This is why the Spirit of Truth, represented as Jesus Christ, clarifies that you cannot judge the sins of the Father upon the children. The sin rests upon the one who commits it. If the children are the one that commits the sins, then the sins will be judged upon them, but righteously. So nonetheless, this descendancy now must be created of a willing progeny that eventually develops into the serpent kings of ancient Babylon, these ancient serpent pharaohs of Egypt, that all symbolage themselves with a serpent that even stretches the globe to Mesoamerica and Mexico, that's associated with this Quetzalcoatl, this plumed serpent, that really comes from the land of Egypt, that's also associated with the Olmecs, which they themselves come from the African gold coast of Ghana that are also associated with mining, that's completely connected to this gold, which is also connected to these ancient serpent kings, also known and affiliated with the house of gold. So there's a lot of information to take in, but I need you to see that this descendancy had to be created and started a seed the sowing of the tares amongst the good wheat by Satan, as, as Jesus clarifies, had to partake. And that's exactly what this happens when these sons of God, these fallen, mix and mingle themselves with the daughters of men. So there's a birthing moment then, but the birthing moment now has amplified itself into the macro into what the real moment of the birthing has been all about all along. The whole idea of producing these Nephilim children was to produce the necessary genetic stock in which this being known as Inki, the fallen prince, could be born into this temple, this temple that needed to already be defiled in the flesh by its own will, by its own choosing. And this relates all the way back down to the atomic structure of the atom that's even related to Adam himself, who was given dominion over the earth, 
which is related to the terrestrial physics, which is then related as the terrestrial energy management of this world that you might recognize in association with the magnetic polarities of this planet that is also further displayed within the erratic field of the human being itself from micro to macro this dominion this connection this ability to have the right to have dominion over that which you yourself have sprung from and conquered just as Jesus Christ just as the spirit of truth just as the story of Genesis attests where it describes mankind created from the dust of the earth and then the earth brought forth the creature after its kind and then this dust itself really represents mankind at its earliest evolutionary stage where from the very smallest particle of triune creation of electrical chemical and biological to eventually form the first cell that eventually forms the first creature that eventually strives for the first goal to become more by the promise and the potential that is already offered to it by the life that lies before it within the conditional environment that itself was set upon. So because mankind has evolved from the very dust of the earth by the will of God instilling within this dust the very seal of the potential of creation, mankind by this overcoming its environment deserves the right to have control over his environment. Because mankind now is manifested as the evolution of the perfect mirror of the creature that has overcome the environment that it exists in. Understand that. Understand that. So, the seal needed to be broken of the dominion of mankind because it could not be done all at once with mankind. A portion of mankind had to be created where it could readily be done to where a descendancy that could be produced that eventually have evolved into the Illuminati would carry out this work and then their supposed ancestorship, their descendancy would be the vintage stock of genetics symbolized with the phallus of Osiris, the DNA, the life force material, these ancient serpent kings that they could clone and create this as this wickedness, this dark matter to put in their supposed God particle. It's a far-reaching plan, a far-reaching plan. And the key to understanding it all in this woman in travail from Rev 12 lies with this statue right here. So let me just simply say now that you can also Google depictions of Ishtar itself clutching her breast in the very same way. And what I'm trying to tell you is that this Ishtar mythology is directly coming from the history and the very real event that took place that is recorded in Genesis 6 with these daughters of mankind that are being chosen now as the birthing cows to produce this golden calf of Samaria. Samaria is northern Israel that has a connection further back to Samaria and of course the legend and the mythos of the Anunnaki that connect to Anak or the sons of Anak that connect us further back to Enoch that we know is connected by Cain in this land of Nod. So here's my point. Here's my point now. This, this statue is of course an early rendition of the sacred feminine. I'm telling you that it comes from the region of Mount Hermon, the Jordan region itself, the place of descent, Yardan, where these sons of God are recorded in the Book of Enoch to take this oath to choose these women. This statue is a direct historical recording of that event and that will at the same time give you the correct beginning symbolages for this goddess Ishtar to show you that it is really nothing more than a depiction of our own women being selected by these fallen sons of God to produce this fallen race, as I said, to complete the great work, to restore him into a material form. Now here's where it's gonna get interesting. 
Notice that this statue has eyeliner around it. And it's obviously a Venus-like figurine, the breasts, the velocity. And I want you to start to see what it starts to say right here. That's going to connect us to the Book of Enoch in a few different ways. Features are painted, the eyes outlined with bitumen, sometimes emphasized with green or blue-green eyeliner. Paint mostly red often appears as stripes on the forehead, cheeks, torso, or legs, perhaps as indications of clothing, ritual scarring, or tattooing. I want you to see something here. It says the variability of the figures evident in the details like facial features and painted stripes suggest efforts to represent individuals. The representation of six toed feet on one of the statue reinforces this impression. Now, this is the book that I'm reading from. Lost Treasures, Great Discovery in the World of Archaeology. All right. And it's a Barnes & Noble book. Basically what I would consider a coffee table book. Um, so now as we see this depiction, an actual historical artifact that is also associated with other statues like it that have beings with six toes. Now, I want you to understand something. The Hebrew Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 20, records these giants, these offspring, these offspring of the giant as having six toes. What are the odds that we have the sacred feminine Venus Ishtar figurine with even painted eyeliner. And you have to remember, in association with the Book of Enoch, look here from verse 10, this chapter here. Then they took wives, each choosing for himself, whom they began to approach and with whom they cohabited, teaching them sorcery, incantations, and the dividing of roots and trees. And the woman conceiving brought forth giants. So now you see the women, all right, associated with the fertility, the offering up of their womb. And then of course, in the very same region, you just saw recorded statues of beings with six toed feet. Now, what I'm trying to stress to you is the very odd nature that these female figures are showing this eyeliner, this eye beautification at a very early time. And this is ancient, ancient Neolithic art. It's even older than they themselves attest to, but I think at this point they're given the credibility at least for 7,000, 8,000 years ago. So let's go ahead and look what these sons of God begin to do here on this chapter and it says and the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments the use of paint the beautifying of the eyebrows the use of stones of every valuable and select kind and all sorts of dyes so that the world became altered all right now this is all being taught once again to the daughters of men and then once again to their progeny which now these beings have planned to set up as the kings of mankind which you can further see recorded within the Sumerian tablets that describe these very Anunnaki set up the very kings of this world with gold and then you have to understand that this is one of the real reasons why they themselves are mining gold here at such a furious pace. It's not to suspend it in the atmosphere of Nibiru, which in reality, in a unique way, is code for the planet Jupiter. <laughs> but yes, there is this 
system out there associated with the binary star, but it's not associated with this Nibiru planet like you guys have all been told. Unreal, unreal. So nonetheless, you see now why the woman in travail and how it gets its roots, how it's associated with Ishtar, the connection that you see with even real archeological evidence that hails from the very areas from which the mythos themselves take place. And I can, you know, let you read some of this here. The recent excavation at in Gazal near Amman in Jordan. All right, so all you have to do is simply look up these locations and understand that it is the region at the base of Mount Hermon that is completely associated with the story of the Book of Enoch and these the women of men being chosen um, specifically for this task, for this vow, these fallen ones. And as I said, it leads up to exactly what you see in Revelation chapter 12 um, that produces the necessary genetic stock that now rightfully this Inky, this Lord of the Earth, this Lord of the Abyss can enter into just if he had the willful constituents to complete this work. And of course we know that that's what these mystery schools have been all about. That's what the big secret is that they themselves don't really fully understand that I do hope that they see through through this and understand the evidence before them. Now, guys, there's gonna relate more. I don't know if I'll get the chance to do it here, but it's gonna relate more to this Ishtar having the connection with the seven chakra. And now I've told you before that the seven chakras are a very real thing, a part of the human condition, a part of the human metaphysics, the, hum the human um, temple path, as I would call it. But as you see, the serpent has diligently sought to invade the path of this temple. And we see that he has successfully, even with all of the assemblages associated with the wickedness of the serpent, he has successfully gotten around that, even the rising of the Kundalini into the temple, willfully allowing the serpent to come into their lives, has not dawned on these people as not being something that you wanna do. And then of course we know that this temple is really supposed to be connected to the dwelling place in the house of Jesus Christ, as he states that he dwells within the temple of his true believers. So you cannot have Jesus dwell in your temple when you have a serpent that has already been allowed to willfully occupy it. And you have to understand that the serpent knows all about the chakra system. And we'll see if I can show it to you here. This is connection about scripture that declares that they cannot go back up to heaven, okay? book of Enoch nor raise up their eyes to heaven on account of the disgraceful offense for which they were judged it says I make I might make the memorial of their prayer ascend up before the God of heaven because they could not themselves thenceforward address him in essence just as we saw in Revelation the high spiritual ensemblage of these beings symbolized with the dragon have been banned from the spiritual abode that's being equated as heaven not the physical abode the heaven to them being associated with the Shinar moon place now we're talking about a real spiritual dimension a real place of a real higher resonance of dimensional quality and what you now see is the density of this matter that surrounds you. Trust me on that. So, I'm going to try to get you to possibly see about how they've revealed something to these women before their time. 
important. And that's going to get you to understand something that makes many of you turn from what you're cursing as Christianity in connection with this wickedness. Because really, I told you, Jesus Christ has nothing to do with Christianity. I really have nothing to do with Christianity. None of us do that follow after the words of Jesus Christ because he completely broke down the religious authoritative system and simply said, anywhere where two outward temple created by the hands of man and a priest to ordain some sort of communion with God, this can be had by true and living faith, true recognition that God is your creator and that you know, you can simply commune with him like you do your father, your your earth father. You can be as real, you can be as casual. You don't have to be in a prayer repetition, which is absolutely spoken down against. Your prayers are supposed to be unique. Your prayers are supposed to be from the root of your true feeling, which should be responsive to distant to different conditional environments, which means your feelings are going to be changing with the conditions of your growth, which means your prayers should also reflect that change and that your prayers shouldn't be traditional, blotted out, you know, remembered words of emptiness. Your prayers should be unique aspirations to convey the thanksgiving that you feel and that have ever grown in your experience with coming to know the Father through His eternal son jesus christ as he's poured himself out upon all flesh as the spirit of truth i hope that you guys understand that i really do i really do so uh we see it says this is something to keep in mind the habitation of the spirits of heaven shall be in heaven but the but upon earth shall be the habitation of terrestrial spirits who were born on earth now this is describing once again the connection that any of these beings that are found with this birthing on earth are going to be bound to it and not be able to ascend to heaven now we know that these nephilim descendancies born on earth but yet they are a part of this high spirit faction known as the sons of god which you, if you follow my videos, you should understand that the pyramid, the Giza complex, symbolized with the great sphinx, the lion man, is telling you what the book or the chapter of Ezekiel 19 is telling you, that this location is created for the storage of these terrestrial spirits that were born on earth. And it's a great mystery. It's a great mystery that's connected to why the, even, the pyramids are even connected to ascension because yet it is detaining them for a period of time that is known as sevenfold, 70 generations of which we ourselves are coming to an end of. So the habitation of the spirits of heaven shall be in heaven, but upon the earth shall be the habitation of terrestrial spirits who are born on earth. So when I say terrestrial spirits or in Enoch we say terrestrial spirits, you also have to think of terrestrial energy of which we see the star tetrahedron gives us the connection to our dominion over the earth. Now the earth is symbolized as dust, which is symbolized in the smallest particle of an atom, which in that geometry we have dominion over. So as we see these beings are bound within that assemblage of the great seal, the star tetrahedron itself, even being symbolized with the pyramid above ground, you know, as above, so too below, you have the same pyramidal geometry that's below ground of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So these terrestrial spirits being bound within the seal is also a part of the control of our dominion, of which they're trying to break. That's why they themselves have not been able to overthrow our world until this successive sevenfold judgments that have taken place from the Garden of Eden time until now that have followed this world age chart succession that the Mayans have tracked um, that is 
a part of duration of some 5,000 years apiece. And if you do the math, we can reach back to about 40,000 years ago, which is what I did in that video series entitled The Start Date for the Garden of Eden. So I want to show you some scripture here if I can find. Here we go. All right, listen to this. This is where I'm telling you that these beings have related something exclusively to these women, the daughters of men, that become associated with the core of the mystery religion teachings or the Eastern mysticism teaching. And that's going to be the seven chakras that's associated with the seven stars. That it will be now associated with the seven stars of the Pleiades, which should be even further connected to the constellation connected with Taurus, Taurus, the bull, and even connected to Draconis. So understand that what I say is real. And these people are really trying to fight against this. And I, I know that some of them, they themselves mean the best of intentions. And for those of you that do, I, I respect you. I don't have anything against you. I really don't. Um, I just wish that people don't have to die because of some sort of doctrine of some sort of dead letter written from thousands of years ago that you people have been convinced that you believe that you need to carry about and celebrate and there's no celebration in this murder um it's not the people of the united states the citizens the individual dwellers of these states that are causing all this wickedness it's a part of the founders and I'm showing you the origin of the founders is associated Ephraim that has Egyptian descendancy that's connected to this mysticism that is now being fulfilled by these mystery religions that are further affiliated with these modern secret societies. So get a grip, get a clue. So here's where we see the chakra thing come into play. Say in heaven, have you been secret things? However, have not been manifested to you yet. Have you known a reprobated mystery? And this you have related to women in the hardness of your heart. And by that mystery, now remember that mystery, this is where we get the evolution of where these mystery religions come from, of which Ishtar is the queen of Babylon, the queen of this mystery, the queen harlot of these mystery religions. And by that mystery have women and mankind multiplied evil upon the earth. So this revealing of the seven chakras, which has been revealed early, and it's the thing that the wisdom that the serpent is offering, and that's why you see the connection with the caduceus, the winding serpents upon the staff that are further going to connect to the kundalini, the serpent path of ascension along the 33 spinal column of the vertebrae, and of which will connect to the 33 degrees. But if you understand the reflection of the 33 degrees, when the serpent rises at that level, it actually kills the Christ consciousness. It doesn't bear it because the reflection of Christ was killed in the 33rd year. So the fullness of the macro is the reflection that the serpent is actually destroying what these people believe to be as their Christ-given potential of perfection that the serpent has shamefully promised them so early in their childlike adolescence of spiritual maturity, which still persists to this day because if you understand the book of Joel 2, when these beings ride upon their horses, the locust, a.k.a. Um, these Danites, the 13th judge of Israel, when they come upon the world, the world is depicted like Eden before them, which means basically the world is at the spiritual state of the first root chakra that is depicted as red that is still based upon the apple of temptation, which means the whole world itself is still deceived by the doctrine of the serpent. So there has been no evolution of the enlightenment of the supposed brethren or the enlightened ones of mankind. They are all still bound and captivated by the same serpent lie, which keeps them fixated upon the vanity of ye or gods that has taken place at the very root of Genesis. So this thing that has been related to woman has been the very... Ah, power temptation, which has corrupted these mystery religions that have fostered these kings and these serpent kings that have gone on to develop what we know as the Elites that now see themselves as the lost ten tribes of Israel. Incredible. So get a load of what I showed you here and really absorb that this statue comes from the Mount Hermon 
Jordan region is showing one of the first assemblages of the Ishtar Venus figurine clutching her breasts. And you could simply Google Ishtar images clutching the breast and you'll see it come up. Now, I'm gonna close this video showing you something that is gonna be relative. And then I'm gonna come back with another video that you just gotta see. You just gotta see. Uh, it's important to understand the fullness of this when people mock me as I talk about the second cup. Like, like I'm saying something that's not relative. And I want you to see that it's relative exactly with Revelation chapter 12. It's, it's connected with this EFAC. ephah or measure a woman in the ephah a sealing weight upon the mouth of the ephah confining the woman we know that that woman is israel is israel just as it says in rev 12 the woman is israel but more importantly israel depicted as the manifestation of ishtar in association with the ten horns that are upon this dragon so the ephah confining the woman and the stork wing woman so here's where we come into Ishtar, and then the stork-winged women are now going to be reflective of uh, this Wadjet and Nekbet, we know as the two ladies that are in assemblage of this vulture, which you see will be in assemblage of the great white cow, the very same reflection of Ishtar itself. So these stork-winged women are a way to, f to symbolize to overlay symbols that are displaying that this Nekbet and this Wadjet, the very same epitaphs that they have, that they are the protectors of these royal children. So the measure that's in the ephah is of this wheat that's been divided. But in reality, I told you that it's the tear because you have to remember all this has taken place in the month of Cancer, which is associated with Urgot, which is associated with this delusion that takes place upon the wheat or the source of delusion that can be eaten upon the wheat that is really known as a leprosy or a type of cancer that grows on the wheat titled as ergot. It just so happens to be the very blackness that's associated with the word ephah because ephah itself also means blackness as a dry measure of grain. So who's going to the moon is the tares. It's the wheat that's been affected with the delusion the strong delusion, the hallucination, the LSD, the ergot. And we see that they are going to be responsible for the cup, which I tell you is the second cup that's going to come from the moon. So it's saying the stork wing women, which is going to be Nekbet and Wedjet, whose only function is to bear the ephah and women away into Babylonia. Now I said that, remember, ecclesiastical Babylon okay, associated truly with this whore is really going to the land of Shinar. And we know that this Babylon is further associated with sin, which is further associated with shining. It's going to be the dark side of the moon where they've prepared this base for her. So symbolically, an ephah is a measure or a cup, stands for something which has come to the full so that God must judge it. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the amazing part about that. So if we're talking about something that's been sealed, okay? I want you to look at the Iraqi dinar and see that this egg assemblage, that this dragon, the Mashushu dragon assemblage for Marduk, a further assemblage for Inki, is, is sealed, is hermetically sealed. Now, the same ceiling you see is being depicted in Zechariah 5. But we know that something has to break this seal in association for this birthing to take place, which would really be the water that we see that this serpent is going to be associated with in this egg. And if I can get it to show up, some of you have seen it before, the watermark that is in this egg is a wavy lines over and over and over again it produces 
what is known as the sine wave. Now you can see it there on the small, but this is all about the egg breaking in association with a woman in travail, the woman birthing. But it's also connected in showing you a unique, a unique connection with the seal. So as As we see in Rev 12 that the birthing point really in all reality is at this Shinar location, just like it's recounted in Rev 12, and then they hope to come back with this king in all their glory, um, which of course is after this sacrifice where they've been supposedly for this duration that it's been taking place as the tribulation for us on earth, this three and a half years that we go through um, as it's recorded. But remember, Jesus says that this time is going to be shortened. It's going to be shortened. So in other words, the measuring cup that I was trying to display is a measuring cup that's associated with the measure of wheat that has really been affected with this ergot, which is this dark prince, this strong delusion, and then its association with the second cup record, quoted in connection to Revelation chapter 18 that I call this millstone, Revelation chapter 18, verse 21, 22. All right? So, just to let you see real quick, Second Samuel, verse 20. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers on every foot, six toes, four and 20 in number, and he also was born to the giant. All right, all of that should have been highly clear, highly relevant, and not just something that's gonna go in one ear and out the other. It is the most solid line of sight that I feel at least I'm going to be able to present to you to show you the reality of our true history and where this essence of these fertility cow goddesses come from and how all of this is being played out in Rev 12, Zechariah 5 and that it's really all about producing this ultimate fallen one just as you know its origination and its inception was to produce these lesser fallen ones so i am coming back with another video and this one will be where i read off the two basic symbolic figurative depictions information that is going to compare Nekbet and Wadjet and Ishtar directly to the features that you see them displayed, the characteristics in Zechariah 5 and Rev 12. And I'll just simply read all this in order. And now that you've heard everything that I've said thus far, you can just simply hear this read to you all in order. And I'm not gonna you know, stop over and over. I might stop here and there as I tell you, but uh, you'll be able to begin to understand finally what all this has been getting at for all this time. So let's see if I can leave you with maybe something here real fast. I'll just save it for the next video. Thank you guys. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to come back tonight with the next vid. Chances are I'm not. So look for the next video tomorrow night. Thank you.